up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Bookmark. I am your host, Sherry Joy. I am half of the DigiCast, and this is book six, part one of Now I See You, Mountain Mystery Series, book one of five by Shannon Work. This book was published in 2020. Before I get started, I am going to ask you to just pause for a minute and like and subscribe to this video and our other videos with the digicast and follow the digicast on youtube and um i also want to say thank you to all of our followers and listeners we truly appreciate you very very much um i am excited we are both excited to bring you awesome content and to keep that going so thank you so um this book is a book that I have, you know, I've read the first half. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about my, um, my predictions, my thoughts, what's going on in the first half of this book. So before you continue listening, if you are interested in reading this book, I would suggest to read the book first and then come back and listen to the show because I do full-on spoilers. I'm seriously talking about the book and what's going on in the book and my predictions, as I said. So I don't want to spoil that for you if you are interested in reading this book. Um, I do recommend the book based off of what I've read so far. So if you were kind of like, oh, should I read it? Yeah, go ahead and read it if you are a reader and you like to read. Um, if not, or if you have read it, continue onward through the book. All right, so the book takes place in Colorado. It's mostly taking place in Aspen. And um, the main character, her name is Georgia Glass. She's an investigative reporter who is from Denver. And she just um, took a job. Well, she quit her current job. And she's like a famous investigative reporter, like, you know, um, what like CNN type of stuff. So she uh, just took a job in LA for a, a not really an independent network, but a network that is run. It's a family owned business from what I'm gathering. Hopefully we learn a little bit more about that later um, as we go, you know, through the book. But the book starts off with, um, I'm assuming it's a guy. <laughs> we do not know, but I am going to assume that it's a man. And he is, or I will just say, we start off with the um, person who is snatching people and, you know, unaliving them. And he is saying that I'm just going to say he, it's fine. He, I'm predicting that it is a man. Um, he is saying that he chooses his people, his victims wisely and very, very carefully. So, so far, you know, from this first chapter, we learn that he's unalived somebody already, um, by strangling, you know, them. And it's been a month and he buried her body, you know, very well. And he's, he's almost like, gee, I shouldn't have hit it so well because nobody has found this body yet. But they found the body that I that I just, you know, did not too long ago. And I buried her uh, off a brush, like a dirt road off of a mountain road. Um, and they found her. So he's he wants to be famous, right? He wants to go down in history as the most famous serial bad person that... Um, I'm, I'm like struggling here because I don't know what you can and cannot say <laughs> as far as words on YouTube. So, you know, I'm struggling with that a little bit this episode. It's okay. Just bear with me. I apologize. So, um, right. So he's, he wants to go down in history as the most famous serial person. So we're learning, you know, that he's also walking around Aspen and he's fitting in. He's, he's among the crowd and he's, you know, just your average Joe walking around as if nothing is going on. So then, um, so Georgia, she just inherited her uncle's home in Aspen. He was a cop and he is, you know, he's deceased. He, he died and 
he was also, well, I said he was a cop. He was a detective <laughs> and he has this big, beautiful home. It, it's a Victorian, it's old, you know, but it's structured very well. Like the, the outside of it and the, 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 the foundation of the home is perfect. It's old, it's good quality. It needs some work on the inside, some love and care. Um, and then she has this garage that is detached from the house that actually just needs to be like torn down and rebuilt because it's completely under code. So she's traveling from Denver to LA, but she stops in Aspen for a little while. She She's taken about, I, th I think, she, I believe she said six months to, um, you know, kind of rest and vacation and get this house together and work on that and collect her thoughts and everything before she goes to LA. And forgive me, it's either six months or six weeks. I believe it is six months. Um, I'm sorry, but <laughs> there's, I'm telling you, there's a lot going on in this book. I really feel like I'm reading a whodunit. I am halfway through this book and I'm still being introduced to new characters. It's insane. So moving, moving on. So she, that's why she's in Aspen. She's checking out her, her inheritance and she's meeting with, um, or her realtor. His name is Jonathan and she's working with him with the, she does have to pay like the taxes on the house and some other stuff, but the house is hers and everything has to be switched over into her name and everything. So Jonathan just wants her to walk through the house to make sure that that's what she wants to do. And that's, you know, the house that, you know, that she, she actually wants to keep it or, or sell it. Um, but she actually wants to keep it. She told him she actually wants to keep it. She likes it. So she doesn't know what she's going to do with it. Is she going to live there? Is it going to be her vacation home? Is she going to rent it out? She has no idea, but she knows that she does want to keep it. So she is working with Jonathan and Jonathan is a local and he knows pretty much everybody in Aspen, you know, in this book, you know, we learn that and, and we kind of know, you know, in actual life that all the celebrities, you know, some celebrities live there and all the celebrities rich and famous go to Aspen, you know, to the mountains and the resorts and all these Louis Vuitton stores and things like that. And very, very expensive resort town. Um, but there are just like any resort areas, there are down times, down seasons and things like that. So I'm kind of under the impression that this is it. We're not really sure if it, if it's, winter or if it's like almost winter or just after winter because we're not really talking about that like it, it doesn't mention any snow i mean obviously they do mention like the snow cap on the mountains and stuff but i mean that's a given but it is cold and it's rainy so we do know that um but we don't know if it, it i'm under the impression that it's not snow season but it is cold and rainy quite sometimes of the days because they do mention that in this book. The writer does mention that. So anyway, um, so Jonathan's the realtor. Then we have a contractor. His name is Carl and he is hired. He's the one who's hired for the garage, you know, to tear down the garage and then build it up and all that. So he meets Georgia at the house. Well, back up. Sorry. So Georgia is staying at a hotel her first night there um she's you know she's at the hotel she didn't want to stay in the house yet because she hasn't done a walkthrough yet so we don't know if it's safe or she doesn't know if she wants to actually keep it at this point i kind of jumped the gun here um so she's staying at a hotel and she gets this she she the next morning she gets this crazy text message of her in the hotel in her room like looking out the window and it's you know weird to her it's like well oh my god not again right so she's being stalked so she we learned that in denver she was being stalked by um what she thought could have been a crazy fan um so she was actually so um she actually writes this news story on a man named Angelo Palladino and that tie and he's he's got ties to the mafia in New York so 
Angelo and Estelle, they're murdered. And so she's the inve- she's the investigative reporter. So she's going into this, you know, this investigation. And she actually interviews. Um... Okay, so she investigates. She does this. She covers this news story on um, the New York ma- on a family in the uh, you know in New York the mafia a, a mafia family in New York, <laughs> uh, the Paladinos. So Angelo and Estelle are married. They're a couple in New York and, you know, they're tied to the mafia and they are murdered. So she is actually interviewing Tony, which is a family member of, of Estelle and Angelo to find out like what's going on, what happened. And Tony actually ends up being obsessed with Georgia and he ends up stalking her and goes to jail, you know, for stalking. And while he's, so she thinks it's him. She thinks that he's, you know, he might, he might be out or out of jail or, you know, he might have somebody on the, on the outside stalking her. So she calls her detective person who was in charge of the case. Uh, his name is Mark back in Denver and she's like, hey, I'm being stalked. I think it's him. And he's like, no, haven't you heard? He's in jail still, but he's in prison now for killing a security guard. So you're completely fine. And she's like, are you sure? You know, did you, are, are you sure? And he's like, yes, I'm positive, but I will check it out. So he actually, the Mark does go check out the prison and he talks to Tony to see, hey, do you have anything to do with stalking Georgia now? And do you have anybody working for you on the outside that is stalking Georgia now? And he's like, no, I didn't stalk her in the first place. And I got bigger problems to worry about than having her stalked now. It isn't me. I'm not your guy. I never was. Mark is convinced that it's not the guy that's stalking her. So we don't really know anything else about that. That's just like a small portion of this crazy plot (laughs) in this book. (laughs) So back to the house. So Carl comes over to look at this garage and see what he needs to do and collect everything for the renovations. And they go in there and they check it out. And then he sees like this box, like it, it, it's like a, um, what like a locker box type of thing what a trunk there you go he sees a trunk and he opens it and he's like oh this looks old and he opens it and oh my gosh it's a body <laughs> it's it's not funny it's a body and um you know they immediately call the police and then we find out that it's actually Rachel Rachel Winston and you know she's wearing high heel shoes and she's got a scarf around her neck so she was strangled and we you know, it's just like a whirlwind for them. It's like, oh my goodness. But she still wants the house. So <laughs> she still wants the house, but they're going to demolish the garage. They were going to do that anyway. So the cops are doing their investigation and everything. And once they're done with the investigation, they do start to demolish the garage. Now to backtrack, we will not backtrack, but we get some back information that we learn and the person, the serial person was at a party. So the Winstons are a wealthy family. They're like, I don't know, just wealthy. I got, I, they're business people. They're wealthy. And Rachel is an heiress and her sister, Sophie had just, or Sophia had just got married like a month before. So the parents were throwing like this big party and everybody in the, you know, every, all the, the in crowd people, the ton, no, the, all the in crowd people were at the, were at the party, everybody who's everybody. And the serial person was actually there. And we have this couple, Jonathan and June Murphy, they're an older couple who were, you know, also there. And June is a straight up like, ugh, she is so horrible to her husband. She's cold hearted. She's mean. She's very like dismissive, you know, cold shoulder, just whatever. And Tom, her husband is kind of like over it 
and done with her. And he's, like, married to her, but it's, like, he doesn't want to be, but they've been married so long. Like, he just ignores her, but he's miserable. He's so miserable. So she's got this, like, Hermes scarf, and they go to the party and everything, and it's, like, this, this, I don't know, green and yellow Hermes scarf. I had to look it up. I was, like, what the heck is a Hermes scarf? And it's a thing. <laughs> it's, a, like, a rich thing. Um, so they check, you know, the bags and stuff and her scarf her, their coats, their purses, scarf, everything at this, at the check area and they go mingle and party. So the serial person is there and he actually sees Rachel, you know, she's drinking champagne, sloshing around and she's obviously drunk and can't walk straight. So she goes to the coat check area. She grabs her coat and she's flipping through things and she sees the scarf and she puts on the scarf and she's like trying it on modeling in the mirror and there was something intriguing about her to the serial person to where it's like she's my next victim so she goes out for some fresh air and then we don't know anything else then because this is his perspective now um of how he chose her so he she goes out for fresh air and then he says nobody nobody saw her after that until they just found her body so also what we learn uh from the serial person in that particular chapter is that he is proud that he chose the vacant house um because he stumbled across something as he calls gold which is a scrapbook so remember the uncle he was a detective so he stumbles across this scrapbook that has all of these old clippings of you know things that are going on in the town so apparently there was a serial person in the 50s who unalived and strangled five women in you know in the 50s all a month apart all with a scarf so the serial person now is like hey i'm gonna go down in history i'm gonna be a copycat and do this right and no one you know will will ever tie the things together or if they do i'm gonna do it better so that's what he wants that's what he wants to do he's like now a copycat I'm calling him a copycat because this is so far he's done two strangle strangulations that are the same as in the 50s. Um, so Georgia finds out about the the um, the serial person in the 50s just by, you know, because Jonathan knows everything that's going on and he's, you know, this is such a quiet town and this is such a good town. Nothing bad happens here. And Jonathan's like, well, nothing since the 50s. So she's like, well, what happened in the 50s? So she goes to the library and she talks to the historian. Her name is Brenda. And she's like, I want to find out what happened in the 50s. So Brenda is helping her figure out what happened in the 50s so they are finding like all of these articles and clippings and what actually happened is the serial person in the 50s his name is Gerald Ray Toomey T-O-O-M-E-Y Toomey Toomey um he like I said strangled five girls with scarves all a month apart and she learns that information and so she takes, you know, she makes copies and everything. And Brenda is helping her make the copies. And she takes them home. And she's like, because she's an investigative reporter. So she takes them back to the house. And she's like trying to learn more, everything she can about that. And she talks to Jonathan. And Jonathan is like, you know who you should meet? You should meet Tom Murphy because he is, uh, he's very good at the psychological stuff. Um, he used to be chief of staff at a hospital in Manhattan. He and his wife, remember June, the mean one, just moved to, well, not just, but moved to Aspen about six years ago when he did an early retirement from chief of staff in the hospital in Manhattan. <clears throat> so they introduce, she introduces, or he introduces Georgia to him and she goes over there and talks to him. So she's a little freaked out. <laughs> she sees like all these like books and then she sees books on ser on serial people, um, in real life, serial people like Charles Manson and Bundy and a couple others. And she's like, oh, wow. And he's like, well, that's what I do. I, that's when she finds out that he studies. He studies the serial people to see why they do what they do. And he know. and then he's talking to her about like the movement and the way people 
minds, you know, the way the people's mind work and stuff. And she's actually asking him questions, trying to get behind what happened in the 50s and then trying to figure out what's going on now and also her stalker. So she's talking about copycats and he's like, well, I don't know much about copycats. And she's like, okay. So the more they talk, the more creeped out she gets because Tom is just weird and he's, she, she, he's giving her like weird vibes. She's not liking the conversation she's having with him. So the conversation ends, they're done and she goes home and that's that. And then later that night or a couple days later, however long later, you know, chapter later, <laughs> uh, Tom and June are having a conversation again because she's really upset June that they have to do another interrogation about what happened at the Winston party. So they did the interrogation. They talked to everybody that was at the party when Rachel went missing. Then they talked to the people, some people again. Now they want to talk to everybody again because they found the body. So they want to just talk to everybody again. So June is all like, how dare they want to talk to us twice? We had nothing to do with that. And oh my goodness. And then she starts talking mean about, you know, the Rachel's parents and stuff. And Tom's like, yo, their daughter just was unalived, like just strangled. Can you like not do this? And she, you know, she's just nasty. She's just mean. And then she finally, she says something like, um, she alludes to the fact that she's upset that he retired early but then she's like well does do people know that you're sneaking out you know at night so i basically she knows that he's sneaking out at night and what he's actually not telling her is that he blacks out he has blackouts and doesn't know what's going on hours at a time sometimes but she knows that he actually does you know sneak out of the house. I'm telling you, like, there's so many characters. This really is a whodunit. It's like everybody has a motive here. Every, there's, you know, I, I my predictions. So the first half kind of ends with this. Well, well, okay. So they go to Rachel's funeral. Everybody's at Rachel's funeral. And Georgia wants to sit in the back as well as the detective that she's working with now. His name is Jack. And... Um, actually there's two detectives. There's Jack and Luke. Luke was actually just promoted and Jack is from New Orleans and he was just hired here. He actually, Jack actually thinks that he was hired to groom Luke as a new detective because in a small town you don't need two detectives. I don't know. I think that's just like hearsay for now. But um, Jack and Georgia are sitting in the back of the church because they want to see everybody and their reactions at the funeral because they both believe that the serial person is in the church because serial people want to see the outcome of what they did is the explanation in this book. I'm not an expert. I'm talking about <laughs> what's going on in the book and what they're saying in the book. Um, so they're looking around and they're watching everybody and they don't really see anything. And if they do, they don't really mention it. Then the next day they have this sit down, this interrogation. So they have, a, they're in a conference room big enough for 27 people. They have everybody that was at that party there, the chefs, the sous chef, the, the head chef, the staff, the guests, everyone is there and they're asking everybody these questions. I'm talking from ages like teenager to 80 something and they're ruling out people, you know, obviously the elderly people who are like, obviously not <laughs> the culprit here. They're being ruled out and they're just asking all of these questions to everyone. So then they talk to June about the scarf, right? Cause nobody knows about the scarf except for Georgia and Carl because they found the body and the police and in the in the, the serial person so they're you know they want to know they're trying to get a feel for everyone so they talk to june murphy and they ask her if they've seen if they saw if she saw anybody with a scarf and she's like yeah i had a scarf 
and it went missing. And I told my husband to call the Winstons. He said he called them and I, and you know, they didn't find the scarf. So they were like, okay, well, what did the scarf look like? And she describes her scarf perfectly. Well, we know that they didn't have anything. Well, we know she didn't have anything to do with it because we read in that chapter that the serial person saw Rachel just randomly pick up a scarf and chose to like wear it. So we know the Murphys don't have anything to do with that. So they actually talk to Tom Murphy and while they're talking to him, he's like sweating profusely his upper lip and they're really, um, looking at his body language and everything that he says and all of his answers and they know he's lying. The problem is, is that he's not lying about the scarf. <laughs> like he has nothing to do with the scarf. We know that he's not lying about the scarf in the way that it happened. Meaning, you know, he said that he didn't call the Winstons about the scarf to see if they found the scarf because they had just found out that their daughter, <coughs> excuse me, that their daughter was missing. So he didn't want to like bother them with something stupid as a scarf. So he left them alone. Um, but why did he tell his wife that, you know, he did call? Well, he told her to get her off of his back. There you go. Um, but there's still something else about him that just rubs the wrong way with the police and with everyone. And I actually think he's having an affair. Um, so the historian, her name is Brenda and she's helping, you know, after she helps Georgia, she, she's thinking about it and she's like, why does this sound familiar? This, this, you know, this to May persons, Gerald Ray, why does, why I've seen this before. Why? And then she's like, I remember. And then the next chapter we, we get the serialist perspective and he is saying, well, you know, I said I was going to choose my people wisely and perfectly, but now I have the perfect person. So now they know about me looking for Gerald, you know, did I, the the research on Gerald. So nobody, nobody knows that now that that's what I did except for the librarian. So the librarian has to go. So he's thinking nobody knows the connection yet. Well, they think the connection Well, okay, hold on. Sorry. Officially, nobody knows the connection except for Georgia. Georgia is thinking that there's a connection, a copycat. But the serial doesn't know that. The serial just remembers that he looked up this information months ago and the person that helped him was the librarian. And so now with these two strangulations, maybe the librarian will put two and two together. Okay, so I don't know, sloppy serial? I have, you know, I mean, dumb criminals? Who knows? So he's like, well, I got to take care of Brenda. And unfortunately, he does, um, but differently. So she's actually shot in the back, right? And, and the other two are like strangled. So it looks like there's no connection, but there could be. We don't know yet. This is kind of where we are with all of that. Um, so I'm going to call it. And I'm going to say that I actually think, I don't know, it's hard to think. <laughs> There's so much. Um, like I said, it's a whodunit, man. I think something is definitely up with Tom Murphy. I think that he's cheating on his wife. I think he had an affair with Brenda, the librarian, because when the cops, when the detectives ask him if he knows Brenda, he says, no, he doesn't. He's never met her before. But his wife worked closely with her on charity events. And when he said that he's never met her before, he starts shaking in his um, neck throbs. I, I don't, I'm not a police officer or I'm not a detective. So ac according to the detectives in the book, like that's a sign that someone's lying. So um, I think that he had an affair with Brenda. I think he had an affair with Rachel. 
And the other, the other uh, woman who was strangled, her name is Greta Moss. She's a German model. We don't know anything about her yet. We just know that she's a German model. That's it. Um, right now they're focusing on Rachel. So maybe we'll learn about Greta. I have no idea. So that's where we are. Um, what if June had something to do with it? Cause she's so cold hearted, you know, what if Jonathan, the realtor, he knows everyone it's, 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 it could go any way. And I can see all of these twists and turns already. So I'm pretty excited to figure out, you know, to kind of come to the conclusion of this. So, you know, let's see. So stay tuned <laughs> for part two. Um, of Now I See You by Shannon Work. So I also want to just pause again to say thank you so much for listening and following us and, you know, being part of the DigiCast world. I appreciate you. We appreciate you. And thank you. Thank you so much. The best thing you can do to help us is to like and subscribe. Like and subscribe and just, you know, share our share our channel, our feed, everything. Um, you can find us on YouTube at the Digicast One. Uh, we have a blog, the Digicast.substack.com. We are on Flipboard. You just search for us, the Digicast. Facebook, where the Digicast, Instagram, the Digicast, Spotify, the Digicast, and also at the um, in the description below, you will see our Amazon affiliate link page where we do, you know, where we um, suggest awesome things that we like to buy and do. You know, we travel, we bake, we cook, we do it all. <laughs> so, you know, we've been once told that we were the dynamic duo. So. There it is. So just thank you for being part of the Digicast world. We really, really appreciate it. I am very much looking forward to finishing the other half of this book and coming back to see if my predictions were correct. Um, but yes, again, this has been book six, part one of Now I See You, Mountain Mystery Series, book one of five by Shannon Work, published in 2020. I will talk to you, or I will... I don't know. <laughs> I don't I talk to you, I suppose. Yes, uh, I'm part two very soon. Until then, love the world. <laughs> <laughs>